Okay, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say that my next guest and I have probably seen each other at our absolute lowest points. Digging deep, vomiting, uh, and finding the strength to put one foot in front of the other as we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, after that trek, I retired my hiking boots. Stephanie Karlowitz, however, did not. She has actually gone on to climb more mountains and is reaching new heights in the world of personal training as president and CEO of Epic Fitness and Lifestyle. Um, her certifications and her ongoing projects are, trust me, like way too long to list. Uh, but I know that she is going to make for a very fun uh, and educational and interesting podcast. So welcome to episode 37 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, please please check out extensionmarketing.com. Hey. Hello. I'm really excited to have you here. Me too. Um, I should also say that um, 37 episodes in, no one has ever actually brought me a drink. <laughs> well, I'm a little knew- nervous. It's very green in nature. <laughs> well, if they knew you, they'd know that you hate drinks other than <laughs> coffee. So, you know, yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to hydrate you. No, I, feel good. I appreciate it because it's one of the drinks that you actually have mm-hmm. at Epic, right? Like, yes. Yeah, in, in your facility. Yeah. So we just launched a base camp cafe mm-hmm. in June. So I wanted to bring food into the mix of the gym environment because mm-hmm. At my old location, we had people going next door to Starbucks and getting those awful frappuccinos, and it would just kill me to see that happen. And uh, so I was like, like, "They finish a really great oh, workout, exactly, and then they, they go exactly." Right <laughs> and I or I see them in the drive-through, yeah. and they're getting the frappuccino or the double latte at, with with cream or whatever. And I just thought, you know what? I think this is more of a convenience issue than it is about them trying to sabotage themselves. So I just thought I need to do something about this. So when we moved to our new location. I'm like, this front end part has to be a cafe and we have to have dairy free options. We've got to have salads. We have to have things that are grab and go and we have to be quick. So we try to make our smoothies under three minutes. We time our our Mm -hmm. CSSs because we want it to be fast and it has to taste good. Mm -hmm. So I love that you have continued to evolve. I mean, your story is really remarkable as to how we've gotten to epic uh, fitness and lifestyle and how it has become such a big thing that you can have your studio and your cafe and and kind of make everything work. Because this has been a long journey for you to -hmm. to get to this point. Um, And so I kind of want to go with that. You and I actually worked together quite a bit when I was back at CTV Morning Live and I had created something which was Today's the Day and Mm -hmm. you were actually one of my uh, experts, kind of like my experts on call that we came to. So we've we've probably done like, I, I don't know, maybe like 50 to 100 episodes yeah. segments together. Oh, yeah. Especially because today's a day was like, we would do eight in a row, yeah. right? Yes. So, yeah. And you were like that first interview we had, I, I watched that our anniversary party was not too long ago. So I was going through old footage and I saw that's the first interview you ever did with, with me. And I just like... I was like, is that me? Seriously? (laughs) Like, holy crap. It was six years ago and it was before we opened and it was just on the street on George Street. Oh my gosh, really? And I'm like showing you movements and I'm like, I don't even recognize myself, but... Well, we're going to talk a lot about movements because a functional movement is a, a really big thing for you. Uh, and so we had done, because I, I want to talk a little bit, because we really shared this experience of Kilimanjaro together. I know. Yeah. Like, I honestly, and I was saying, like, I retired my boot. Like, that altitude sickness, <laughs> like, for me, it wasn't the physical yeah. aspect of it. Like, I loved the hike. I loved the hiking 12, 15 uh-huh. hours. Like, I love that part. Yeah. For me, the altitude sickness, I was so And you were the first so to get sick. sick. I was the first to get sick on day one. Yeah. At 10,000 feet, and I vomited from day one mm-hmm. until we like, and I was still vomiting at, <laughs> at the peak, you know, like, and then it wasn't oh, until we came, like, I, I can't, until I forget how sick I was, I cannot go yeah. on a mountain again. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's fine. Like it's, yeah. there's no nobility and pushing yourself or taking drugs to get, I, I mean, it's just, there's so many beautiful mountains that are under 5,000 feet that you can just do go for a hike or go for a trail run or whatever. You don't need to do that high altitude training. I mean, I love it. I don't, but I don't have that genetic issue where I I deal with altitude that way. And it's, and it's genetic. It's not a fitness issue. No. And it was funny because Sean Dawson, and I actually have Sean coming on the podcast in a couple, I haven't booked in a couple of weeks from now. I, he said like, it's like a 30% chance, like and it was funny because I shared a tent with Carol and Bryn, two of my girlfriends. And he says one, a third of the people <laughs> almost are on like a runner's high. Like they actually like get 
like they love the feeling that they have in altitude mm-hmm. and that was Carol. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they're like some people are, are fine but they need the medication. They've got slight headaches and, you know, but they manage the bearable. That was Brynn. And then they're like, and a third of you will get really sick. Yeah. <laughs> and, that was like, yeah. and that was me. Yeah. And there was nothing we could do about it. Like, no. You know, oh my gosh. But you've yeah. gone on to do other, you've gone on to do Machu Picchu. Yes. I and, just went to Colorado a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I did a 14er there. I did a Mount Quandry. My goal is 10. 10 above 5,000 feet mountains. I did Mount Marcy a couple years ago. I didn't do Everest this year. It was too crazy with the gym opening. Mm-hmm. I just, I had to say no to it, unfortunately, but I will go back there. Will you do that well, again? Well, not go back. I've no, never been, yeah. but I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. What was the idea for you of kind of setting this goal? Like even right now, like you want to get to 10 mountains. Like are you goal driven? Has it always been that you have to have something set and something that you need to attain? Well, I think it's actually been kind of the opposite because like you, I was a I was a competitive athlete. And so I grew up in the world of get on the podium, do whatever it takes, sacrifice everything, go in half broken or half dead, it doesn't matter. And so I was really, you know, brought up that way and I really respond to that. Like I'm a person that that shows up, you know, like I work well under pressure. So I was a great athlete. And then I retired from my sport and I couldn't find the next thing. And it was really, really tough. So I needed to find something like I I joined soccer. I joined, I obviously worked out at the gym, but it wasn't quite the same thing. It wasn't the, it wasn't a community. I I mean, I saw those people every single day of my life since I was six years old. You know, it's a community that you never can really find again. You you grow up with this group of people. It's like an exclusive Okay, I'm going to say like you were a figure skater. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like doggy, like that's a competitive world. Totally. Even if you were in... In, you know, had this family feel. Oh, Everyone yeah. was still competing against each well, other. Well, people have watched yeah. I, Tanya, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, and it's, it's not far from the truth. I know. I, there was a, some aspect to that, yeah. Yes. And gymnastics is the same way. Dance. Yes. Like, I think... Um, it's this weird sport world where women are supposed to be strong and graceful at the same time. And it, and we're mostly soloists. So like, it's just you, you know, you can't rely if you're having a bad day, like everyone's watching you have a bad day. Like if you're a member of a team, maybe someone else can take over for you, you know, or your captain can kind of like Mm -hmm. perform a bit better. You sit on the bench for a game that doesn't happen in, in the sports we were in. So you know, I, it took me a long time to find my thing, and I really didn't think hiking was. I didn't sign up because I thought, you know, this is going to be a good goal. It was like, I need to occupy myself from my personal life right now, and this is what I'm going to do. And it just spoke to me. It was like a feeling I had inside my body. And I didn't know the details. I didn't own hiking shoes. I never dreamt about it. I would I would go into Eddie Bauer or Mech, and I wasn't inspired. You know, I was not ever the outdoor person. But it was just something about, I think, Sean and that group and that info session that I was like, yes, I'm just a yes. And then I fell in love with hiking, not because it was about conquering, but I learned how to slow down and have patience. It was the opposite of my sport because my sport was about kill yourself to get a medal. And hiking is not, it's the exact opposite. It's one foot in front of the other. It's its all about the journey. Mm-hmm. It's not about, it's not even really about the summit because you still have a day or two days or four hours left, which means you have to descend. You can't just go to the top and then like you're done. The helicopter is going to come get you. It's not no, how it works. And to be honest with you, coming down is half the battle. It's like, the toughest it, part. It, there's some tough aspects to, to coming yeah. back down. Yeah. yeah. So I've just, I mean, hiking to me, it's obviously evolved, but Mountains specifically are such an amazing analogy for life, you know, especially with with personal training and people trying to get better with their health and and just life in general. I mean, we're climbing, we're trying to get to the top of something. You know, we have this imaginary milestone in our life. We think that we're everything's going to make sense when we get there in quotations. Um, But really, if we don't if we don't enjoy the journey, if we don't take in all the views as we're walking up that mountain, we're going to miss a lot. And also you have you can't just no one's helicoptering you up up off of that that peak you have to descend too so that's life you know there's going to be peaks there's going to be valleys there's going to be really low moments but it's part of the game this it's part of life yeah and I think you've you've taken that. It's such a great analogy, you know. I feel like I'm right there, was like looking at one of those posters on a wall, you know, with this big <laughs> mountain and like you know, life the the journey, right? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you kind of you've gotten to that point because I don't think you were there, you know, 15 years ago Heck when no. you kind of launched into this. So you. Um, Personal training wasn't really necessarily what you kind of thought you were going to be doing as you were not, you know, it, not getting into the workforce. No. At all. Not at all. I mean, so 
like honestly and I'll tell you I'll tell anyone who asks me and it's kind of like a funny thing I wanted a job that paid more than minimum wage when I was in my in university like that was my goal it was like I just I, I've worked cashier I've been the retail I've done the bartender thing like I've done all that stuff I mean I've had I think I calculated I had 15 jobs by the time I was 18 my dad worked me hard young yeah. uh, you know he was a um, second generation immigrant so I was working at eight years old I was doing paper delivery routes I was babysitting I was coaching the younger kids in skating gymnastics I was volunteering for block p- parents it was part of a military lifestyle that you know, acts of service is very important. But also I was just, I wanted to do, I was just, that's since I was a kid, you know, I would take the wooden spoon out of my grandma's hand to make my own scrambled eggs. That's when I was two. Like, I just wanted to do it, you know, like stop showing me, like, stop teasing me with you doing it and me watching. I want to do it. So, um, so I had a lot of jobs and, um, so yeah, I gave my resume to every place I could. And it just so happened that, a gym called me back for a women's only um, company uh, or studio, and I really lucked out. I had an amazing manager. I had amazing uh, women who were like ten, five to ten years older than me. So I, I had, I was like Im- immersed in this mentorship type place. And personal training was great. I never really thought it was going to be a career. I wanted to be a, a psychologist. That's what I went to university for. I thought I was going to go into my a master's degree and then do a PhD. So personal training was sort of like, it's easy for me. It's fun. I have an athletic background. I'm good with people. I'm motivating. Um, I care about people a lot. So it was a natural fit. It didn't feel like I was working and I was making enough money to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. And you were at the gym so you could work, get your workout in. Oh yeah. Free membership was like half (laughs) the deal. I was like, sweet. Um, Yeah. So you do this. Do you graduate with psychology? Like how? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did a double major, okay. psychology and English literature. <laughs> what was the intention? Like really, like just a family psychologist, uh, sports psychologist, like where was the interest? Uh, I think clinical was was where I was going. Um, I didn't know the environment. I knew that I was great at getting to, I was always the person people came to for advice. Mm-hmm. I was able to really sum a person up really quickly. That's how I excelled in personal training is I was able to meet someone in one minute and know their pain points and, and know what they needed help with and knew about them more than they knew about themselves. So I knew I had this gift even as a kid. I knew that. So I just thought, you know, psychology, I want to be able to be in an office and I want to consult people. But I hadn't really thought further than that. I didn't know what environment. But I knew at the end of the day, too, that working alone wasn't for me. You know, I was such a team person and a people person that I couldn't imagine just like, you know, one on one in an office by myself, person after person after person. I was like, that form isn't for me, but I haven't figured that out yet. Um, And so Yeah, when I graduated university, uh, it was weird timing. My manager at the time was going on mat leave. And so it was like, well, this management position is coming up. And I'm like, oh, my God, if I tell my father that I'm going to be a gym manager, like, I'm dead. (laughs) Like, I am toast. Like, I, you know, he put me on the piano when I was five. My mom, like, I fast-tracked through English. Like, I played 17 sports. Like, I was supposed to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Like, I can't be gym managing a gym. Um, but I grappled with that and I just thought, you know what? School's always going to be there. I can always go back and do my master's and my PhD, but I'm getting such amazing life experience and... But you were happy here. I was like you were happy. happy in that environment, you know? Totally. Were yeah. Were able to say, dad, listen, this makes me happy here or we're not quite there Well, it yet. was all in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the truth is I was such a rebel that I never asked anyone permission for anything. Like honestly, once I, once I... You know, I think at like 22, 23, I sort of, you know, was able to easily decouple myself from the wants of my family or what they wanted um, and what I was supposed to be. So in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, this is embarrassing. Like, I can't do this. Like, I wasn't bred for this (laughs) in a lot of ways. Or I haven't worked this hard to, to have this kind of a stigma attached to what I'm doing. But then I also thought hey, if, you know, I'm resourceful, if I'm no good at this, or if I can't pay my rent, I'll move on, you know? What I didn't know was that it opened up so many doors for me, and I found the thing. Like, I was so lucky to be able to find, because when I moved into management, it changed the game. I had a team all of a sudden. I was a leader. So I, ha- I was 
a leader with my clients and I had my roster of clients and that was great. But when I became a manager and a leader, I had a whole department. And so then I was mentoring other trainers, younger trainers or even older trainers, you know, to inspire them to actually, you know, you know, who do you want to serve? Like, who is your exact client? What's your personal brand? What aspect of the industry are you interested in? Do you want a diploma in nutrition? Do you do you feel yourself being pulled towards yoga or the esoteric alternative types of things? So, you know, I felt like I was mentoring another group and mm-hmm. I was part of a team and I really excelled more than I ever thought I would. Um, and so I didn't go back to school and I, I did step into that management position um, with this idea of, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if I'm going to be good at it, but I'm going to try. How long did you stay with that until you started to realize I can do this on my own? Well, for me, it wasn't, you know, I did not have hopes of opening up a business at all. Like there was not one day that I worked for that corporate gym that I thought I was going to open up my own thing, which is crazy to say, but it's true. And thank God I didn't think that way because I would have been half in, half out. I was 100% locked in and 100% loyal and 100%, you know, dedicated. And I thought my career was going to be with that company until further notice, you know, like Mm -hmm. every day it was like, yes, yes, I'm choosing it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so what I ha- what had happened was I I became very successful. I you know I, I just I just excelled in so many areas. I was amazing at sales, <laughs> you know, because n- not only with my own clients, like in sales, what it is is it's you have to be have the communication skills to be able to match up what someone needs with what you can offer. That's what sales is. People get kind of weirded out with that that word. They think of like an someone trying to cheat them or take advantage of them or give them something they don't need. Proper sales is all about matching up wants and, and, you know, marrying wants and needs together with an offering. And I was always really clear on that. If I can't help you, I'm going to be the first to tell you because it's going to cause problems anyways down the right, down the line. So I'd rather be truthful up front, you know, and, and honest from the get go. And I think that allowed people to really trust me really fast. And they knew that I wasn't screwing around, you know, like I'm not in this to make money. I really care. You can see it in my eyes. Like there's this passion and this, I'm all, I'm all in and they can sense that. So I had that with my clients. Now I was instilling that within my team. And so naturally we became, I mean, I worked at a little gym, um, in Vanier called the women's only, it was a good life fitness women's Mm -hmm. only club. And we became the number one women's only club in the entire country. And we had the lowest socioeconomic um, region in in the country. So I was able to build us up to being the number one. We, We sold more personal training in that little tiny gym. We had six trainers and like, I think maybe 1500 square feet. And we were, we were putting it on the map. Are you at the one like at the Loblaws? That's right. At the corner of, yeah. oh my gosh. That you can't even see into if you're in the Loblaws. No, you can't. That's good yeah. for you. Yeah. I know exactly the gym you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've built this up. You have a great team. There's there, There's got to be a trigger because yeah. we, know, we, we know that there's much more to the story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So fast forward two years, I mean, I was sort of flown to Fl- San Francisco to mentor other other. Um, uh, fitness managers at the time, I was making that, you know, the 100000 a year. I was 23 at the time. So I felt like, okay, I'm doing something right here. Um, so I might be a gym manager, but I'm locking in the dough. So, but at the same time that the, all this is happening, I moved to a co-ed club. I, I clean up that. So I went to Hunt Club and managed a two-story um center there. And that's when I started to feel that things weren't right. I started to feel myself lying through my teeth about wellness and health. I started gaining weight. My thyroid was out of control. I was getting migraines like crazy every day. I didn't like the taste of anything anymore. Things were happening to my body that I was helping my clients with. I'm like, oh my God, I cannot sit in front of anyone anymore until I figure out what the hell's going on with myself. And the thing about, about, um, you know, getting notoriety and, and mentoring other people and getting, achievements and I was getting awards and I was 
you know, getting all this validation that I was doing the right thing, but my body was speaking another language. My body was screaming at me like, hey, money doesn't doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Like what you're saying and what's happening on the inside biochemically is not right. And so I wasn't living, I wasn't a role model. And that's very important to me. I think it's important to live what you're preaching. And that's the only way you're good at what you do is if you really believe in it. So that started to give me some cognitive dissonance, <laughs> which was my ideal self and who I knew I was meant to be and who I am was so different from the reality. So it created a huge amount of stress in my life. Um, and at the time, you know, it was the trigger was I didn't see the doctor for two and a half years and I just won uh, a nomination for an award. I was top four in the entire country. You know, I was the youngest person on that stage. Um, I was one of the only females and I thought, you know what, I'm going to take two months of my life and just scale it down a bit and I'm going to make a doctor's appointment and I'm going to start putting my health first. And unfortunately, that's not what my superiors had in mind. So I'd asked to go for a doctor's appointment. Um, I think I made an appointment on like a Thursday evening at 6 p.m., like outside of normal working hours, and I was denied that. My boss at the time said, you know, uh, your team needs you and you can't, you, you can't just put appointments anywhere. You need to give me notice. And I thought, damn, I've been killing myself for two and a half years and my health is the most important thing to me. I'm now realizing that. So if I don't have your support, I don't think we can continue. And that was the trigger. I gave my resignation in that night because I just knew I couldn't move on and I had tried, you know, to incorporate. I didn't have the skills at the time, though, to to put myself first for the journey. I was like most people that believe, you know, I'll, I'll kill myself now, hit some imaginary milestone, make all the money, and then buy the body and the health that I need. I was under that, that trajectory, that sort of way of thinking. But the truth is you get all the money and you have no time and you don't even know where to start. You, you can't use the money <laughs> for your health. <laughs> you don't feel good. <laughs> and you feel like crap. You want to sleep for 10,000 years, you know, like, and you don't know, you know, you're so messed up mentally and so messed up in your body that, I mean, also, I didn't see my family for a long time. I had no social life. I really put my career first. I'm happy sitting in this chair today knowing that I did that. It built me up with, a, you know, I had a lot of skills that I developed and all of that. But man, it set me up for the next chapter because as a CEO of a company, I could never burn out like that again. I have people who rely on me. I care too much about my message. It forced me to figure it out for myself, which means now I can help other people. Quick question. When an yeah. employee asks to take some time off to go to a doctor's appointment, do you approve the, do you approve <laughs> the time off? <laughs> I tell them to book a doctor's appointment. Yeah, no, I never make that mistake. But that's a big shift that needs to happen. Like conscious corporate business uh, op operations, like, you know, it's very important to really, I think it's getting more and more, you know, I think with, with the launch of like Google and Facebook, we know about these, these company cultures now where they have unlimited vacation or unlimited bean bag chair time or a pool table in the, you know, but I don't think everyone's there yet. I think it's definitely more in the tech startup world than anywhere else. Um, but corporations absolutely need to start putting their team and their employees first. And that's definitely changed for me. I put my team first. They're actually more important to me than our clients because when they're healthy and they're strong and they're passionate and they're in line with who they want to be, the clients learn just by watching that trainer. So the, the clients get way more results it's funny. faster. I always say, people always ask me like, which, who sh like, which trainer should I pick? And I'm like, I always say to, to people, like, because there's so, there are really good people out there. And I'm like, find the person that you most want to be like. Like and Absolutely. train like and look like and feel like I go pick them mm -hmm. you know like they they will just by being near them you'll want to emulate and, and see yes. and know what they're doing to be able to get that so you know it's interesting because being living it mm -hmm. it's just it's yeah there's, a, there's an aura I find totally people like that there's a definite energy and you know if someone's faking it like there's just something not right it's kind of like an accountant that won't look at you in their in in the eyes you know it's like all right, what's going on? You know, like somebody's just like, always dodging you and like not, you know, you just feel like something's off. And so I think you have to pay attention to that. But it might be off because you're not living it. You know, we have to be aligned. Like our work life has to be aligned with our personal life. 
Um, that's a whole nother discussion. But yeah, well, c- gosh, you were talking about kind of your body wasn't matching with everything. I feel like I'm still in that recovery mode uh-huh. from making that decision, listening to my body and, and yep. kind of making the decision, like, is it worth, mm-hmm. you know, making the money and having the profile and doing all of that? Or yeah, do I want to live and not waste the time so that I don't have the body and the health to kind of have it? It. Takes, like, it, it takes a lot of guy. It, 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 it takes a lot to realize that mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot harder It's easier said than done. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think it's very interesting because I think a lot of company cultures that are not holistic, they actually want you to be too busy to pay attention. You know, I don't know if it's conscious at the top, if they're like, you know, I don't know if there's some Machiavellian type person like playing the puzzle pieces that way, but maybe it's an intuitive thing where it's just like, if we make these people so friggin' busy that they forget who they are and they put all their identity in one place, then they can never not be with us. And so, you know, for me, for example, like there was no time to think about the next step. Are you kidding? I, I could barely think about be in that day. I was so you know, there was so much pressure and there was so much um, that was riding, you know, not really in life, you know, like no one was going to live or die, but it but felt... But you thought it at the it, time. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, which was very similar to how I used to, has, used to feel in my sport. So I think a lot of the, you know, that that me trying to find that next sport for me ended up being my job, mm-hmm. you know, and I brought a lot of those skills into a job and it happened to be a job that rewarded that kind of energy, which was the burnout, hustle and grind energy and like forget who you are and not have enough self-awareness to, to, to make yourself healthy, which is ironic for a gym environment, which trust me, a lot of corporate gyms yeah. are still operating that in that way. Um, but yeah, I had no idea I was going to open up a business. So how does, how does Epic evolve? I met a guy at a bar. <laughs> Bring in Neil. Actually, it's not, it's not Neil. Neil. Okay. No, my investor. Okay, oh, okay. Even, okay. Even crazier. <laughs> okay. You'd think a romantic relationship would start at a bar, but no, my investor. <laughs> so uh, it was a good life Christmas party. We were all going to the after party, and uh, there's a couple guys at the bar, older guys, and one of them was the owner, and I, I knew him just in passing. And there was this other guy who was also an owner, but never seen him before. We get chatting. He's like, why are you guys all just dressed up? And I said, well, it's our Christmas party. We're all trainers. And he said, oh, I'm looking for a trainer. And I said, I bet you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not falling for that one. <laughs> and uh, But he was actually honest and truly wanting a personal trainer. So I gave him my card. And I said, if you're serious, email me tomorrow. He said, okay. So he emailed me the next day. I sent him my resume. He said, hey, can we have a consultation? He told me a little bit about what he was going through. He was um, kind of going through a life transformation. He was a physician. He owned multiple clinics. He had gained 50 pounds. He was sort of in the same place I was in, in a lot of ways, but to the another degree. And he's like, I want to get my life back. I joined a mastermind group. I've got all these books I want to read. I need someone to help me with fitness. I have a gym in my basement. I'm hoping you can help. And so I gave the address uh, to a friend of mine and said, if I don't call you in an hour, this is where I am. (laughs) As every woman should, (laughs) engaging in behavior like this. Um, But I had this like gut feeling that it was positive. So I went... I started training him for like three or four weeks. We started talking about, you know, what is he doing in his life? And then what am I doing in my life? I had just stepped down as a manager. Um, I gave that resignation in. And I just said, I think I'm going to go back to school and do what I had initially intended, which is get my PhD and be a psychologist. And he's like, there's no way you should be doing anything other than this. You're too good. You, You shouldn't. It's just the way you were doing it isn't working for you. And he's like, but if you had your own thing and you had your own business and you do it your own way, you can make the rules. And all the things that you saw that were problems that didn't work for hundreds of people. I mean, I was exposed to hundreds of managers. I was exposed to how it was working on a corporate level. And I saw all the holes and I saw that that it wasn't sustainable. And I knew that, you know, personal trainers are so important to a lot of people. They're changing the world in a lot of ways that there's a way to make this better and sustainable. And, and there's an underserved population that is more interested in the holistic idea of things. And so he quite literally, you know, he didn't get his checkbook out that day, but he basically wrote me a check for a quarter of a million dollars. And we opened up Epic six months later. Yeah, that's a really good story. <laughs> And, and rare, and I want to say. Yeah, yeah, and very rare. But yeah. 
But you had worked for it. I, you know, when the, when you say something like you you were lucky, it mm-hmm. wasn't that you were lucky. You were you were at the right place, and you had done the work to be able to be at that right moment. When I you agree. Met that person to say I've I've done the work. Yeah. This is the right oppor- This is a really good opportunity for me to be able to go to go with. So yeah. okay. So 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 you hadn't met. This wasn't had, part. Of, you had met. Yes, Neil. and we brought him in as a third person. Yes. Yep. So Neil at the, at the time was your significant other. Yes. Uh, because I do. I because you work together. Mm-hmm. You both. You you built up Epic at this point. Like yeah. You, there's the start of you have your gym. You've got your trainers. You have a facility. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting buzz. I know you have a really good client list. Like things are working. Yeah. So we opened up in September. I mean, I got married in October. Um, and this is of what year? 2012. Okay. So I had taken, you know, I think during that time too, when things were, when I was saying yes to my investor, because how many times have you had a conversation with someone and they're like, hey, we should open up this or hey, Mm -hmm. we should work together. I mean, it was an opportunity, but I had to go off my gut and I had done, you know, I had been decompressing and getting in touch with myself. I was going to yoga every single day. I was making appointments with a naturopath. I was kind of putting two middle fingers up being like, I'm going to have a doctor's appointment every day (laughs) until I feel well. I was meeting with friends who were holistic nutritionists and I was using my own knowledge on myself and so I was way more in tune with myself and so I was able to move ahead with opportunities you know in a way that I knew I was taking a risk but at the same time you know I just I knew you know it it was a decision and I once I'm in I'm in so once I make the decision I'm I'm 100% in I just needed to make it and hey if it if it faltered, then I'll deal with it. And if it's not, then okay. So what were you looking for in the trainers that you were hiring? Because you're like you want authenticity. So yeah, we screwed hiring. that up until probably a year and a half, probably seven months ago. That you were screwing that up. Yeah, we hired a lot of the wrong people, many times. <laughs> hiring is not easy. Hiring is an art. It's it's also like you you talked at the beginning about evolution. We've evolved so much. And the trainers that we had during different times of the career of the company, sometimes those people, we couldn't carry them forward with the new evolution. It just wasn't what they signed up for. And so we ended up having to, I mean, we went through a lot of attrition, definitely at, you know, I wouldn't say so much at the beginning because there was this novelty of it being a new studio and people wanted to be a part of it. You know, we were recruiting really great people. Um, I think, you know, you know, Long story short, you know, me and and my husband or ex-husband are not, no longer together. That lasted nine months, so that was five years ago that um, that I haven't had him in the company. Um, so for the first year, there was a lot of work, definitely on hiring and and getting the right people on board. And I think we did a lot of the time, but we had really conflicting ideas of what holistic meant and and where Epic was going. Um, you know, he was very much on the athletic side of things and really wanted to champion the athlete. And for myself, I just knew that that wasn't the general population. A lot of athletes were in the same mentality that I was trying to get out of, you know? So I wanted to put the holisticness back into people's lives, um, not just try to get them to hustle and grind more because I knew that that was not sustainable and it wasn't where my passion was. So although I love working with athletes and, and still mm-hmm. do in a lot of capacities today, but I just knew that the evolution of the gym had to go in a certain direction if it was going to if, if it was going to be profitable, if it was actually going to make a difference, and if we were actually going to grow. Um, so a year later, you know, I had bought him out. We had been separated. I still held on, held on to my investor, um, and uh, I bought my investor out two years after that. That's impressive. <laughs> it was a crazy time. It was That's a crazy really time. impressive. And in between that, you climbed a mountain. I climbed a yeah. mountain. I climbed I, a mountain because of that, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I remember. But... How how therapeutic the that ultimate. was like such therapy ultimate uh, yeah. yeah and and I remember you kind of going through this transition like there was there was a lot to it what I have found to be really interesting is because I have followed you you know like I I had done interviews with you and then we'd had you on the show um, and I follow you like I have really watched this evolve like you have become a powerhouse mm. um, in what Epic has become because even the, the name itself has changed. It was Epic Fitness, right? Mm-hmm. But it's Epic Fitness and Lifestyle. And you, there's like a woman empowerment. I think there's, as you mentioned, until about seven, nine months ago, 
you didn't have that right combination. So what led you to the combination that you have now? And this is where I want to get into how people can benefit from trainers. What are your th- thought process? I know functional mobility is important. So let's get into why it's making such a difference and how this is going to help people. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They're a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Yeah. So, um, so something I always knew, my mother will remind me of this because I often say I didn't want to open up a business, but she would, she would remind me that she would say, Hey Steph, like when you were first working as a trainer, you had this idea of combining psychology with athletic performance. You've always known that you always did it in your own practice. And so where we are today has, is that dream. So although I didn't know how it was going to come about, I didn't know how or in what form, whether I was going to own a business or, you know, just start a movement, you know, or work for myself. I didn't know that at the time, but I just knew the power of yin and yang, which is an, you know, an old age, you know, phenomenon. Like this is, we're talking about a thousand years. We've known the power of, of, of ebbs and flows. That's what life is. It's a hustle and a flow. It's not hustle, grind, burnout. So I've always had this idea in mind and I always had the vision of having a holistic facility. I always knew I wanted a clinic, I wanted a a cafe, I wanted a, a group studio and I wanted personal training. And I knew that it needed to be on trend and I knew I was just following my gut and it evolved over time. So I couldn't see it clearly, mm-hmm. but I knew the the energy of it and so I had to evolve myself, my personal practice, my own wellness. And as soon as I would unlock or open something up, then it would lead to some sort of essence that would dial into my company because we're both the same. We're just, we're we're going down this parallel path together. I'm probably 10 steps ahead of where Epic is because not everything that I'm trying out on myself is, is valid Mm -hmm. in the company, but a lot of the things that stick, a lot of the things that are backed by science, the things that I discover and the people I meet, you know, we dial it back into Epic because we want to change people and we want to help them. So, um, so the lifestyle portion is really important. You know, lifestyle is about the journey. It's about, you know, an outcome is not so much about something happening fast. People think outcomes, they, they want it now. But the outcome that whatever the outcome is, even who we are today and how we feel today is an accumulation of our whole life. It's the journey we've had in our entire life. It's not just what I ate yesterday or how I slept last night. We tend to have this verbiage of it being always short term, but it doesn't quite work that way. So, you know, you're in this state right now, Leanne, where you're trying to still recover like it's a year Like, Mm -hmm. so this idea that I can kill myself for three years or four years, which a lot of people have this mentality, whether it's with their family or their profession or their personal life or their health and fitness, I'm just going to put it on a shelf for four years and I'm just going to pick it up where I I left off and then all of a sudden have these amazing habits Mm -hmm. and like know who to call and talk to, you know, and to get these professionals on board to help me. You know, it's just that that fantasy is a fantasy because it, 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 it downloads into the tissues of our body and it becomes us. That period of our life we have to recover from not just over a year or three years or four years, but we have to unravel habits. We have to unravel mentalities and those things and beliefs, those are the hardest to crack. And those take time, like big time, a lot of time. Do you say that like, cause you say you can read your clients pretty well mm-hmm. and you can say, we're going to start shedding some pounds, but there's a lot of work that's, you're going to start to feel and look a little bit differently, but the real work is still yet to unravel. It's a lot of it's in the mind. We have these preconceived. So you're using your psychology all the time. All the time. Yeah. Totally. Totally. It, it, that's where it starts. It has to come from the mind. I mean, my clients have beliefs that are just incorrect. You know, a a belief that a common client will have is that I'm there to punish them. That's a belief. Like you believe that I'm your parent. That's a problem because we're equal parties moving forward towards a common goal, which is the journey of your life. And if we do not incorporate these, these, the essence of you as a human being, if we don't accommodate for the fact that you need to hydrate, that you need to breathe properly and you need to move, we're in for it. 
We're reducing your lifespan capacity. We're reducing the amount of times that you can actually look at somebody because you're in a mental fog or that you're, you're thinking about something in the future or something in the past. The relationships you have with your kids. I mean, this is affecting every part of your life. That belief that people that, that you need to be disciplined is a problem. And that, a lot of it comes from the athletic world. I see this from a lot of very ambitious type A people that want a trainer to kick their ass. And I try to unravel that and say, listen, let's, let's think of this a different way. We're partners here, but you want this for you. So let's, let's try to have a practice that lasts. Not something that you have to like, you know, slap your face and then like put cold water on you and then like, like amp up for it, you know, because that's not gonna last every day. What is the what have been the best training methods for making that so that there's a lasting effect of, of not going in and going rah, rah, rah and having a timer going and like you yell at them. But like what what have you found to be the, the combination that works? Well, it's it's functional movement, functional medicine and functional food. It's stuff that lasts. And, you know, I think it is getting a little more sexier than it has been in the past. Like I have my practice hasn't evolved hugely, okay. but yes. OK, so when you add the word functional mm-hmm. be, be, before each of those three things that you said, what yes. are you referring to? Like, why is that word become such an it word? It's, well, do, do the, you know what I mean? Like I the, do. Okay. So the commercialization of the word functional is sort of like the commercialization of the word natural. Not everything natural is natural, right? So keep that in mind. Not everything functional, if you YouTube functional right now, I mean, you're not you're going to be mixed with stuff that is not functional. A lot of people and a lot of trainers actually don't understand the definition of the word functional. What I'm saying, which I would boast (laughs) as being the true definition is functional is all about accommodating for the rules and the laws and the science of the human form. So when I say functional movement, there are certain degrees that certain muscles and different joints in your body are meant to move, you know, and it's the same for 99.5. 99 if not 100 percent of the human population there might be some slight variances in the size of our pelvis or the way the the pelvis angles more anteriorly or posteriorly but very minimal differences i mean we're 99 percent like a chimpanzee human to human we're almost 100 percent the same so as a trainer i just need to understand as a functional trainer i have to understand the science and the way the body works um in or and then i need to uh, uh, i need to abide by the laws of that for the human form. So an example would be planes of motion. So there's three planes of motion, sagittal is forward and back, frontal is side to side, and transverse is diagonal, rotation. So if I'm not abiding by the laws of the human form, which means I'm sitting all day, I'm cycling, I'm doing yoga, I'm swimming and I'm running, which means I'm always forward and back, sagittal plane, and I'm not moving side to side and I'm not rotating, there's going to be consequences. There's injury, there's poor digestion, there's bad breathing patterns that happen. So by our cultural um, ways of living life right now, we are not accommodating for the human form. So in training, what I try to do is I take a human being and I say, oh, you sit all day. I mean, check, check, check. I mean, if you live in mm-hmm. Ottawa, <laughs> there's a, a, an archetype of person. Um, even if they're a diplomat, if they travel, or if they're an entrepreneur, they're probably sitting a lot. So I say, we're not rotating enough and we're not moving side to side. We're going to move side to side and we're going to start rotating. Things that happen immediately, knee pain goes away, hip pain goes away. They start to breathe better. Things in their low back start to open up. So when we just abide by the human laws of the body, things change. Now, take that into functional medicine. So, hey, you know, there's certain, you know, nutrition is like, chemistry and our body works in a very chemical way. So if I don't have enough hydration, there's going to be consequences on the liver. There's going to be consequences in my uh, in my breath capacity. There's going to be consequences in my digestion. There's going to be consequences with my hormones. So something as easy as just making sure we're more alkaline than acidic, which is a biochemical and functional medicine thing, I'm already winning the day 500 times more than I was yesterday. So slight changes. And then we, of course, we can get into biohacking and you know, really, you know, vitamin cocktails for IV therapy. There's a million different avenues you can go in once you crack that nut. But once you realize that the human body, we don't understand it. People don't know where their organs are. People don't know. They don't take their their health in their own hands or their human form in their own hands. They sort of outsource it to a medical doctor or a chiropractor. But we need to, we don't, we need to learn about this. We need to know what the what the shoulder is supposed to do so that when it hurts, we know what's going on with it. And if you don't have the time for that, then 
finding a, f- a true functional personal trainer can unlock those things in ways that a traditional personal trainer cannot at this point. What do you mean by a true? True? Yeah. If they cannot define what functional means to you, if they say this tag- tagline, mimicking movements in life in the gym, you need to run. <laughs> that is not a functional personal trainer because it's, it's the science of movement. So a squat is not functional per se, you know, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's kind of like the tip of the iceberg versus all that beautiful stuff that lies beneath it. You know, if I, I could quiz a personal trainer and say, you know, how do the fibers of the glute run? It runs from the, the sacrum to where? Does it go, you know? Do you ask them this? Are you asking your trainers this? No, I mentor them. And this is the, you know, this is, we're still avant-garde. You know, as much as the word functional is more of a buzzword, it's actually exciting for me. I love when people use that word because it it sparks conversation where people are interested in what it is. Six years ago, it was like, you know, eye roll. It's like, I just want to do burpees and make me sweat. Um, And it's changing now. People want to learn about what functional movement is and what functional personal training is. There is a lack of education out there. Um, That's why... If you are interested in this and you're in the Ottawa area, you need to come work with me because I mentor my my trainers. I don't actually, I don't hire them based on skill per se. I hire them based on, you know, if, if they believe in functional movement, if they have tried, um, you know, breathing techniques, if they're yoga instructors, if they're dancers, if they're self-awareness and self-psychology junkies. But, okay, but do you think that a guy who is just... Like you have kind of knocked out in that description, seventy percent of how we usually think of yeah um, a trainer. Uh-huh. Is that fair for me to say? What yes. you have just listed is not the typical. Well, not the one you're going to see in a corporate facility, yeah. but you need to look at more boutique gyms and you need to look at more, you know, holistic. That word is a great word. You know, if someone defines themselves, I'm a holistic personal trainer. Okay, that's a great start. You know, and also too, there's a there's a wave happening right now. There's a ton of personal trainers who are actually getting their holistic nutrition degree right now. Mm-hmm. There's a ton of them actually going into yoga. We never saw that before. There was such a divide. It was so siloed. You were bodybuilding or powerlifting. You never combine the two. You are a stretch person or you're a yoga person but you're not combining that with bodybuilding. We're seeing bodybuilders taking yoga certifications now, and that's amazing. So that's wonderful. If you have a bodybuilding uh, personal trainer that right now that you have who's you know incorporating mobility and stretching and asking how your day is, that's a huge win. <laughs> and we weren't seeing that 10 years ago. There was just this hustle and grind mentality. And the truth is, is that you're going to be drawn to the person that you want because this is this is also a service that you're purchasing. So if you're in a place in your life right now where you want someone to kick your ass, don't feel bad about that. You will end up having to change that though. It's not sustainable. It's going to work right now, but one of two things are going to happen. You're going to get injured or you're just going to get tired, you know, so you'll feel like you need a break. So it's not that personal training doesn't work. Hey, I did it that way for quite a long time and it, it worked, right? It's just that what's the future? What is the future hold and what is the next chapter? Okay, but you're still going to have people that are going to come in and be like, listen, I can't lose the final 10 pounds or I'm getting married and I want to look great in my dress or I'm 100 pounds overweight and my doctor said if I don't start eating and exercising, you know, the diabetes is going to really ramp itself up. So you still have the same needs from a lot of the people of, oh yeah, like so functional. As much as we'd like to believe that everyone's just looking to enjoy their their functional movement and life and feel pain free and mm-hmm. and you know and well, ra- let me, rainbows let me be and clear. unicorns, they, st- <laughs> oh, they still they, they still want to look and feel and great. So that's what they're doing when they're often when they're signing up for that trainer, right? So this limiting belief that functional means not looking great or not being athletic you know, not having athletic performance is crap. They're not mutually exclusive. They're mutually inclusive. So if I get someone to crawl on the floor and I get them to actually use their body weight and I get them to master their body weight, when I add load to that body, it changes. There's something that neuromuscularly happens. I can grab a bunch of weights right now and turn off my muscles and do all of those movements, but I'm not going to actually get the connection with my muscular, um, the muscular um, anatomy, what am I going to say? The engagement, and and this is what you might take for granted as an athlete, that engagement, that line that you're taught to have as a Mm -hmm. gymnast, 
that that engagement allows you to actually shortcut probably 70 percent faster than someone who does not have that neuromuscular connection yeah. so i get people who are general population pick up a, a dumbbell and they're flinging it around like a noodle their arms are like noodles so they're not going to they have to work out seven days a week to get what someone who has that that gift or that that, that learned but it's learned right it's, it's learned. not a gift it's just that it was developed much younger right. but we teach clients that's that how to do that that's what functional movement does I want to let people know, because this is going to be something different for this podcast, is that we're actually going to do some videos. Yes. So for those of you that are listening, we actually are going to be we're going to be filming some videos after this that I'm going to be putting on the website so that people have an idea when we talk about functional, like some of these movements. Yeah. Because I do remember, and both of us are in really good shape. And I was, I'm going to say you in a way, way better because you have the the flexibility and the ability to do these movements. I've watched your videos. I don't think I could do any of them. <laughs> I, I don't, don't like tell I, yourself short. No, like I know that you're going to kind of make me like crawl and put my leg through here and do this. And I'm not going to be able to do it. Well, mobility is a big thing. I mean, function. Like, I'm, I'm so stiff. Sometimes I'm like, come on, like you used to be a gymnast. And I'm like, I think I'm worse off now mm. because everything is just is stiffened. Right. Like I but also, I, I watch there. you and I follow you also. Yeah. And the way you attack your workouts, you know, there's a lot of yang, but there's not a lot of yin. <laughs> no. It's like the hydration. But the yin things, the things that you need are not maybe the things that you're open to yet, but are the things that you're going to start to have to evolve into. As I am aging, mm -hmm. I am realizing this part. I still benefit psychologically from having the... Um, we, we call that the yin. endorphin yeah, rush. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I, like for me, the endorphins are critical. Yep. If I need anything done in my day, it's the workout because yep. the endorphins hit. I am think better. I'm nicer. I'm a better mom. I'm a better wife. Like mm -hmm. I really am. Yep. And I think you're like, if there's anything that I crave and need in my day, it is that endorphin release. Yes. But, um, but I am slowly starting to realize that I still kind of need that, that to come down now after, cause I'm just, my body hurts hurts more yeah and the functional movement stuff it doesn't mean you don't get an endorphin rush it just means i think what's happening is that we end up we want to do at the gym the thing that we're good at let's be honest our ego is like pretty all-time high when we go to the gym and that's all of us we want to do the thing we're good at so that we can get in zone out and 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 then go on with our day so when we look at functional movements like the stuff that we're going to do in the videos we're going to do functional movements and your heart rate is going to go up you're you you will be sore tomorrow but it's just that it's maybe a little bit more complicated or it forces you to think and be engaged in your body when the th you're using exercise right now to zone I don't have out. to think. Right. I don't have to think. Right. And I know with the stuff that you're going to make, that we're going to be doing, I'm going to actually have to think about what my body is doing and yes. what muscle I'm triggering yes. and what part of the body is, is having to, to move. And so I would suggest for you to not give up what you're doing because that's like pulling a carpet yeah. out from underneath yeah. you that's not going to be actually successful. It's to just add in... You know, whether it's a nighttime routine or a morning routine of some functional movements that you can just be in the zone and then put a time limit on it. It's mm -hmm. kind of like meditation. Some people hate meditation. Do it for one minute. Like sit. How do you do a one minute meditation? Oh my gosh. Easy. You sit. Okay. Honestly, Let's how do, do you it. do it? Okay. Okay. Palms open. I'm putting Relax. my, I'm putting my coffee <laughs> down. <laughs> okay. 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 Yep. Palms open. Sit. Okay. If you're listening to this. Uh, unless you're driving. Okay. Yes, don't do that. Don't do this while you're driving. Okay, okay, sit up nice and tall. So yeah. get your chin to be just over top of your chest. Okay, wait, you've closed your eyes. Am I closing so my close eyes? So close your eyes. Okay. Relax yeah. your face. Relax. I have a resting <laughs> bitching face all the time. <laughs> well, now's your I, one minute to Oh my chill. God, like I sometimes realize like my muscles, like mm -hmm. that is like the one thing I wish I could change. Like I don't mean to. I'm, I'm really, really nice. I just always... <laughs> Do I have this resting bitching face? Okay. So you're going to let it go. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. okay so so back, I'm going to yeah. do a, a particular one for you and this okay. is going to help people at home too. So palms open, relax mm -hmm. your face. Now open your mouth nice and wide, way wide uh -huh. and then close it and then be concerned. Bring everything to the front and then open up and bring it down. Okay. Then relax. So think of your belly button. Think of like a ball of breath at the belly button. You're going to breathe in, have it travel all the way up towards your throat. Breathe out, allow that ball of breath to come all the way down to the belly button and breathe out through your mouth. Ball of breath, breathe in, come up towards the throat. 
Breathe out, pass it down. Let the shoulders relax. Relax your face even more. Are you looking? Is my face not relaxed enough? It's relaxed. Okay. I'm just cueing you. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay, one more. Breathe in. Breathe out. Now I want you to imagine roots coming from your pelvis, just where your seat is, into the ground, expanding. And I want you to feel a heaviness you plugged into your chair. And open your eyes. It's, it's state changing. One of the things I want to teach you today is about state changing breaths. How you can literally change your mood. You can change the whole biochemistry of your entire body just by a couple easy things that don't take much time. And this, we just did one, which is a one minute meditation. So if you did this, if you got off your computer, if you got off your phone and you literally just had one minute, or if you, you're in the closet, kids are screaming outside your, your pantry, mm -hmm. <laughs> get in there, they'll, they'll live for a minute, palms open, relax your face, follow that ball of breath and just get into the breath and then walk out a different person. Have you said this to clients and they're kind of look at you like, oh yeah, okay, That's sure. what, we do it in our sessions. Yeah, and then yeah. do you have that, like who, do you have the moms that kind of come in and like, I mean, gosh, we're so many, like it's craziness. Yep. That's why, I mean, that's why I say that personal trainers are the most important people in this next generation, the ones that are doing functional movement, functional medicine, functional food, because if we can get them twice a week, two hours a week, and we get them away from the craziness. And instead of us punching them down further, when they're already like half in the bag, they're underground. So when we have them and we do some meditation techniques and we look at them in the eyes and we get them to do some functional movement, we say, it's going to be okay. You know, it's all right that your hips don't move in this way, but we're just going to take the pressure off. It doesn't, they don't have to move perfectly today. And then when we take half the session, when we let, let them do the things that they want to do, we're throwing balls on the wall or we're doing jump squats. So we're getting that sweat and we're getting that kind of yang activity going. What would you, okay, if you had to pick your five favorite exercises, you, you got to do your five favorite things, what would they be? Functional movement wise? Yeah. Or just like in general? In, well, do functional and then do in general. Okay. So in, I think functional bear walk is one of my favorites, which is we're in an inverted position, kind of like downward dog, but it's on the move. So we're at like a quadruped, hands are moving, feet are moving. It's one of my favorites because it just, it gets the blood to the head, which we don't get a lot of. We get an endorphin rush, rush from that. We stretch out the hamstrings. People's hamstrings are like tight and they're on fire and it activates the core. The second one I would say would be um, a spinal twist, lying on the ground, palms open, one leg up, going across the body and coming back. We squeeze the organs a little bit, we, we relax the glute, our hearts open, our lungs are open, we're looking at the ceiling, it's very relaxing when we're on the ground, kind of like Shavasana, it's that feeling of zen calm. The third one I would say would be um, walking around barefoot would be my third exercise. <laughs> walking around barefoot at the gym, having as much time barefoot, if you can walk outside, you know, barefoot, um, in, the, in the freezing cold even, allowing us to ground into the ground. We have a big problem in our society now where we're just not in tune with nature. We're not in tune with the way the body works. We're strapping our, our feet into these crazy casts, which are called our shoes, and it causes a lot of alignment issues with the hips, a lot of alignment issues. I mean, heels are bad too. The fourth one I would say um, would be, I know I believe in sweating. I think it's important to get the heart rate up. I would say hit training intervals. So whether that's um, doing half burpees or doing like, you know, mountain climbers, I think it's important to get the mm -hmm. heart rate up. And I, I truly believe in hit training. So if it's sprints on the treadmill. Do you consider Tabata hit training? No. What do you consider Tabata? Tabata is Tabata. Okay. Tabata, Tabata is endurance specific. So if you're trying, if you're an endurance athlete and mm -hmm. you're trying to increase your endurance, do Tabata. Okay. I'm going to be really honest with you. Just, we have a couple more minutes. Um, so I do like, I work out sometimes in my, in my house, like I just, the day gets crazy. And so I have yep. a nice little workout at home and I have started doing Tabata mm -hmm. at home and I'll do, so Tabata, for those of you who are just listening, uh, it's 20 seconds on 10 seconds off and you repeat it eight times. Mm -hmm. So it's at four minutes in total and you're doing that same exercise, like yep. each of those times. And I will do 10 Tabatas, Yep. like 10. So I'll pick 10 different exercises and then I'll do those in a Tabata. What am I doing? You're increasing like, your endurance, but not much else. Really? Yeah. Not anything from a, from a like, fat loss perspective. 
because your heart rate's too high. So the science of the heart rate... It doesn't feel like it's too high. Like, I'm doing push-ups or I'm doing, like... Okay, so true to bad, you should be out of breath, which means your breath never actually comes down. Yeah, okay. So I'm not doing it the right way. Okay, so you're probably in a fat-burning place, which is, it's probably not high intensity. Right. Right? So if you were on a treadmill, if you did 20 seconds all out sprint, then 10 seconds, you'd be in the same position. Like your heart doesn't have enough time to come down to, to restore ATP, to restore your energy, to actually allow you to go again. So am I wasting my time doing that many? It depends on what your goals are. Are you just trying to get something in to zone out and feel good that day? Well, yeah. And to, I mean, to be honest with you, if I'm doing eight times the, the, the push-ups or the Spider-Man push-ups by mm-hmm. set number five, six, seven and eight like I'm you know it's hurting right but muscularly not cardiovascularly so Tabata is meant to be cardiovascular specific yeah no and I'm not using it for cardio specific I'm using it for more okay so I would say if if form is if if form is good um you know if you're not pushing through bad technique Mm -hmm. it's not going to hurt you but if it comes to like most people use HIIT training because they want to lose you know, fat. And so from a fat perspective, you need to have that 30 second to one minute rest of the heart rate coming down 30 beats per minute and then going back up in order to get a fat loss effect. So that's where HIIT training kind of trumps Tabata. If you're an endurance athlete, Tabata is a great tool to increase the endurance and get rid of, to increase your time. Okay, well, that's good to know. So I've been wasting my time a lot of my Saturday mornings trying to do. (laughs) Well, do you have a, like if you had a treadmill in the house or something? Yeah, no, no. I, well, I box, like I bought, I, I hit. Okay, so, so that. then do that. Like, whatever, like, your, yeah. your indication is the heart. So if the heart rate's up, then try to get it back down, and then go again. Yeah. And then, you know, high I've been doing that, but I, I work the boxing ones into it. But that's interesting to know, especially for people who are trying all these different mm-hmm. workouts or trying to kind of get as much in at, at the same time. Okay, and then your five favorite just general exercises. Um, Well, squats, lunges. I mean, I think the primal movements are my favorite. So squat, lunge, um, any kind of push, whether it's a push-up, spiral and push-up, or a chest fly or a chest press, um, some sort of row. Maybe it's a recline TRX row or one-arm dumbbell row. I'm um, in some sort of rotation. So a 10 and 2 with a band is one of my favorites. Um, or it can just be like a, you know, a V-sit with a kettlebell going back and forth. What if, what would you have eaten today? Like what's on the meal plan for you today? So today I got up, I have a whole like extravagant morning routine, <laughs> which is a whole nother podcast. Um, but um, I hydrate. Is there, some... is there journal writing in that morning routine? I There's think... daily planning. Okay. I'm not yeah. a fan of journaling in the morning. It gets okay. me distracted. Okay. Um, so I had some sea salt with a, a cup of room temperature water and some lemon. That's like hydration. You know, I get dehydrated quite a lot. So I had that and then I had a coffee and then I won't eat until this smoothie right here. So I fast in the morning. I have my smoothie um, and then I probably will eat around 536 and I'll have like protein, veg and you know, healthy fat, like an avocado or something. If I'm going to snack on something, it'll be from the base camp cafe. I have these little like almond chocolate almond cups and they're gluten free, dairy free. And it's like a little bite. How many staff do you have now at Epic? 26. That's 26 staff. Mm-hmm. Like, do you kind of go, how did, this is amazing. Yeah. Like that's, that's just a business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. That's 26 people's lives who, you know. Are- yep. Yeah, it just, you know, over the past month, it's really hit me because I've I've gotten out of the sludge of, like, the trenches. I was opening the gym. Like, at the very beginning of, of Beachwood opening up, um, I was doing everything again. It was kind of like I was starting from mm-hmm. the beginning um, because we put so much, so many resources and so much time, effort, energy, and money into the development of the gym that, that we had to really cut cut things back when we first started um, to rejig the whole business model structure. And so um, so I put a lot of my own sweat and tears and my own labor into that process. I was opening the gym, closing the gym, you know, getting the group class, class schedule correct. I was teaching five classes a week, had my own clients, mentoring new trainers. So just in the past month, I've been able to get back to where I was. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that I can be here today and I have no concerns about there being a fire on site or that clients aren't being served. You know, I have a, a remarkable team right now but we had to hire them and hire them you know hire the right people and that's been a journey for us in the past seven months is really zeroing in on our hiring avatar who it is that we're serving and who are we um you know bringing on board so that's been big and at this stage like do you have like this list of like favorite client like just people's lives that you've changed oh my god yes Probably like 50, honestly. Really? Yeah. But there's about 50 people's lives that you know you've... Like, I know their first name, last name, I know their whole journey, and they've been with us for, you know, two to to five years. 
Yeah. Major life changes. Major life changes in the way that you wouldn't anticipate, like family changes. Like we have a, um, a client, Matt, who introduced gluten-free to his kids. They have less outbursts now. Like it changes a family to just try things. And I'm not, I'm not a huge proponent for diets for, for people, but I think it's important to try stuff and see what works. Try paleo. If it's for you, you'll know. You should feel better. If you don't, then, you know, try something else. Um, but things like that in meditation, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that actually work in the trades, bricklaying companies and, and, and electrical companies. And these CEOs and these entrepreneurs are killing themselves for these companies. And construction's tough. So we get them in, they get meditating, we start giving them new ideas, they start flowing on the ground, they start using their body weight. It's really cool, we change their food, they get a smoothie on the way out, they're going to the construction site with a smoothie. That changes the game, man. You know, that's huge. And they lose weight, they feel good. Yeah. At the end of the day, you feel good. Like you go to bed going, I've, my mission, like what's the mission statement of the day? I think at the end of the day, it's a difference between... You know, the athletic sort of analogy is that kind of like, you know, you want to leave everything on the table. You want to walk away a, a, a half a person. You know, when you, want, when you lay in bed at night, you want to feel like you did everything you could in that day. But we're telling, we're teaching people to feel dead at the end of the day. And that's not what we should be doing. We should be feeling pe that people have momentum, that they're, they have energy, that they feel good. They feel whole at the end of the day. So, but you want to be able to look at back on your day and say, I did everything I need for myself. I accomplished everything I wanted to do in my profession. And I felt like a whole person at the end of the day. I think that's a huge success. If people are looking to connect with you, where can they find you? Instagram is like my personal blog. I think <laughs> Instagram is my favorite. So at Stephanie Karlovitz uh, with a K. And uh, epicfitnessottawa.com. There's actually a cool quiz that you can do for the Epic Life Formula, epicfitnessottawa.com. Okay, what is this? What's the quiz? So the quiz is four questions. It's yeah. all about the Epic Life. So it asks you questions about our formula. Four hours of functional movement a week, four cups of healthy fat fibers and, and greens a day from nutrition, four hours of nature a week, and 40 minutes of self-care a day. So there's a quiz, four questions, and it, it basically gives you a rating out of 52 and then gives you some tips on how to improve your score. So if they go to epicfitnessottawa.com forward slash formula, put your, your email and your name in there, and then we'll be in touch with you and help you through the journey aspect of things. Gosh, I don't know where I would land on that <laughs> quiz. I really don't. Most people are really good does at going to the gym. Does, does self care is self care going to the gym? No, no. Oh gosh, that is my self care. That's my forty five minutes. Well, you can choose to put that under does, self care. Does, does me hiding in the shower and taking extra long <laughs> shower count as in self care? My okay. Gosh. Okay. I, I think everyone should try that quiz right now. It's, a it's good, on the website. It's on the website, yep, forward slash formula. Um, self care, you know, forty minutes is not asking a lot, but it is in our culture. But you know. You start with five, you get into 10. Well, hey, I just did a minute meditation and didn't look like a resting bitching face. That so that counted for my minute right there. <laughs> 39 more to go. Um, thank you so much. We'll have to kind of redo this. And I want to let people know, head to the website because we're going to have some videos uh, that we're going to shoot uh, on a lot of the stuff that you had actually just awesome. mentioned. I have a feeling we're going to be doing some bear crawl. We might. We might be doing some of that. Uh, and also a reminder, please let people know about the podcast. It is uh, Traveling Oceans and Borders. It has been so fun to see the numbers uh, and where people are listening. Like it's, it's been so fun, but it needs to uh, continue to kind of be on this pace. And so the best thing is when people like it or subscribe or mention it to their friends, uh, share it, uh, the more it grows, uh, the better it's getting. And I, I was telling you, like we have Sean Dawson coming on who's, who's climbed every single mountain, like the top seven, right? Like, yeah. This, like ev like yeah. every one of them. Uh, but I'm booking now into January. People are cool. calling to get on and I'm like, I can maybe get you in January, February now. So it's so nice to be able to see. Um, and I'm really excited for uh, those that are listening uh, and who are really enjoying and giving feedback on the podcast. That is episode 37 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you back here next week. 